thanks for joining us today, thinking about communities and water values. I've called this a bit of a provocation. I want you to think about who you're going to encounter during your research and what is a community, how this links to this idea of water values that we are looking at in this work package, uh, work stream. So the questions uh, we're going to ask you are, what do we mean by community? Why is thinking about communities useful in considering water values? And then think about what methods are useful. And I will give a few examples of this. As ever, I always uh, like to think about the definitions of the thing we're talking about. So if we think about what we mean by community or communities, um, there are a number of different uh, definitions, but actually if you, you can boil them down pretty much to three main groups. Um, the first being communities of place, which relates to where people live or a particular area. The second is communities of interest, which is where people have something in common. And the third is community of identity, which is when a group of people have some similarity. Of course, uh, we can think also about biological communities, uh, ecological communities, um, and I think that's also quite useful uh, in thinking in human terms. It's about where plants or animals are growing or living together. Uh, the, the concepts of community are quite complex and um, and they reflect the kind of complex systems that actually Xanthi was talking about yesterday so eloquently. Um, and communities are not static, they're very dynamic, they change all the time. And I think what we're particularly interested in here is perhaps the shared values that communities hold and how you access those shared values. So just thinking a little, reminding ourselves about values. Uh, these are built up through interactions between humans and natural processes. And of course, we're particularly thinking about water. Um, they are dynamic as well uh, and overlap. And um, this, this um, diagram, which I find very useful from Stevenson, indicates the kind of time depth of values and how values are built up. So you may see some values as surface values, but you have to remember there are many hidden and embed embedded values that we also want to try and access. So moving on to think about these three types of communities and their values, I'm going to talk through now uh, these three uh, communities of place, communities of interest and communities of identity a bit in a bit more detail. But I think the first thing to remember is that these may overlap. They're not necessarily discrete. And so actually when you're trying to identify them, you should consider that um, people may belong to more than one type of community. So firstly, thinking of communities of place, these are located in a particular physical space geographically. So you can think about your own community in your village, in your town, your city, it can be various scales that we're thinking about. Um, and so the values that emerge from such communities relate to the place and, and the interactions with that place. And often you can see expressions of those values with of those communities in the materiality of the place. And it reminded me of this lovely visit we had to the community garden in Ethiopia, where we had people who were expressing their own values of that place very clearly in their pride, in the way they talked. Uh, but also, actually, all you had to do was look at the plants that they were growing. The health of them, the care that they were taking, clearly showed the value that they had of that place. And the way they were working together, the way they had molded that landscape so that they could grow those things. And through these kind of interactions, you gain, um, communities gain a sense of place and over time. This kind of uh, group of communities often overlaps with communities of interest, which I will talk about a bit later. So thinking a bit more about communities of place, in the UK, um, there have been a lot, that, well, and elsewhere actually globally now, there's been a lot of work in relation to participatory research with communities of place. Uh, 
And there are things which I think are quite useful to understand from that research, that these communities can be a real force for change in the environment. Um, but also they are often overlooked as a source of, of knowledge, particularly local knowledge. Uh, we need to think that people are actually living in those landscapes, what we call living the landscape, experiencing it every day. And the knowledge that they have is built up from that experience. So they understand very clearly often that environment and the place that they're living in. And they have a considerable grasp of the issues that go with that place. They also have um, an ability to envision a future. And sometimes policymakers, for instance, forget that, that people can have an idea of what they want for their future. And that can be really useful in participatory research. There's some quite interesting research coming out on an idea of commoning, which is a force for change where people actually take over places and make them their own. And there's quite a good literature about that. Um, I think a key issue that's coming out of the research is how you get people, uh, these kinds of communities of place to express their knowledge. And that is important in our own research. One of the things um, that is, is useful also to think about is how is the identities that grow up from communities of place. Settled cultures lived in relatively small landscape context, context while more nomadic cultures often traveled significant distances. And so the imprint on the landscape was as nodes and links. And many nomadic cultures travel through large areas of landscape. So when you're thinking about communities of place, you sometimes have to think over very large areas of landscapes. And of course, we have many uh, nomadic cultures who still do this. Thinking about such cultures provides a different dimension to thinking about what community of place might be. And when people migrate from a place when they are part of a community of place, they often still retain a connection to the place from which they've come and the identity that they that grew up from that place. Uh, there's quite a useful idea here, solastalgia, which some of you may have come across, which is um, a concept which is sometimes used in relation to this idea of nostalgia about places from which people have come from. So in this painting I'm showing here, uh, depicts migrants from the famous Highland clearances in Scotland, where many Scottish communities of place were thrown out of their villages and had to migrate, often to North America. But many of these communities retained a strong sense of identity derived from their uh, original places and the values that grew up from them. And these kinds of ideas and representations of place and identity are often used extensively in advertising, for example, not only in relation to identities of place, um, but uh, in, in more general identities. And so there's the picture here on the right to the bottom of Newcastle Brown Ale, which again, some of you may know about, even have tasted. Um, and of course, this idea of identity of, of a particular place is used extensively. Um, and you can link it in, in food research, people link it in food research. And these kinds of representations are quite useful in, in order to understand the kind of values that people put on their places. Uh, so moving on to think about new places, uh, following up this idea of migrants, um, research in, uh, of these kinds of communities show that the physical places, the new places that people go to are highly contested. But often the identities and values remain constant or uh, change into change in the new places. Knowledge is transported with the communities as they migrate. Um, they don't necessarily lose knowledge, they may gain new knowledge, but they retain the knowledge of their old place. And they often use it to mold the new place that they're in. So in these pictures here, you can see that this in this these squatter settlements, people have molded their own small landscape spaces by planting flowers and plants, uh, vegetables often. And this may help communities to be resilient in the continual dynamic molding and remolding of the new places where they arrive. 
In the UK, um, it's quite useful to think about how communities of place is, are reflected, uh, the values of communities of place are reflected in public policy. And this is taken up in a number of ways, such as in village design statements and neighborhood plans, which engages communities of place and feeds into local planning uh, policy. And if we think about our research and how we actually access communities of place and their values, um, they are perhaps the most easy um, a group, of, uh, uh, group to contact because they are in a particular place generally. And so you can use things like census data to access information about those communities. Um, you can do things like site um, and um, place-based activities to engage with them. Obviously, you can observe what people are doing in their places. And there are um, also opportunities for things like citizen science and physical inf interventions. The images here are from some work I did in Yorkshire of some of the methods that we used using artists as intermediaries. So moving on a little bit to our next community group um, that we're thinking about, communities of interest. These are defined by common interests or common purposes. And often you can think of uh, groups such as social and political movements, clubs and charities, water aid, for instance. Often they are about learning or recreational or lifestyle related, related activities. Um, they may be physically remote, so they don't live in the particular place necessarily, although they may do, um, but they have an interest in the place or an interest in something to do with um, the activities around that place. And values are expressed in, in various different ways. You can look at things, for example, like newsletters, um, policy documents. They may include experts um, and uh, professional groups. So you can look at their documentation to think about their values. And the kind of research methods that you can use to access communities of interest um, are, are more, it's more difficult actually, because sometimes they are difficult, more difficult to define and also more difficult to contact. And they may also be unwilling to express their views or values. If you think of political groups, for example, they may not actually want to express their values to you as a researcher. Um, however, things like citizen science methods can be useful, for example, um, in relation to environmental groups and activists. Um, so you can also use things like, again, interpretive analysis of texts of things that they produce, policy analysis, as I said. You can also use semi-structured interviews and focus groups, I think are particularly useful in, in understanding the group dynamics of these kinds of communities. And you can observe the kind of events that they may put on. And there are various forms of surveys that you can also use to access their values. Thinking then going on to the third group here, the communities of identity. These are individuals who are tied to each other through socio-cultural characteristics that may transcend place. So again, you may find communities of identity in particular places, but you may not. And when we're thinking about this kind of group, we're thinking about things like ethnic, cultural or religious groups, um, or various other groupings such as gender. Often this kind of communities are maybe minority or often excluded groups from policy conversations. Um, they have various different kinds of knowledges and what you may find that they also define their identity in various ways and show it through particular languages or symbols or dress or behaviors. Often they may not want to be contacted by outsiders and so that as a, as a researcher is really challenging. They may have strong relationships with place. And they may, but they may, if they move, if they migrate from those places, retain that identity. So this, there is this difficult overlap, I would say, between identity and place-based communities. There may also be lots of conflicts, actually, between these kinds of communities that you have to consider. 
The kinds of methods that you use are probably some of those that we that I've discussed using other groups, but I would suggest that gatekeepers are particularly important in thinking about if you're trying to access this kind of group. And in particular, positionality is important. So just thinking about how you contact and work with all of these kinds of communities, I would really emphasize thinking about your own positionality as a researcher and the way you are framing your research. And that may not be the same, of course, as the community that you're looking at. There's quite a good literature about the researcher as outsider. Um, and of course, some researchers are also insiders um, and what that actually means in terms of your research. And I'd recommend you look at that and we can, we can list some of those useful references for you. And sometimes there's an assumption that actually being an outsider is problematic, but that isn't actually always the case. Sometimes people will talk to you as an outsider, whereas they would not talk to somebody who they perceive to be an insider. So again, this is a complicated issue. Creative methods work well with, with all sorts of communities. Um, in, in many ways, what you need is to instigate interest when you're trying to get people to express their, their values. It's important that you do good background work and get to grips with contemporary concerns, but consider that there are scalar implications. So you need to think about the communities at different scales um, and how you might build trust if you're thinking over a large scale, that's particularly difficult. Also think that everybody has some kind of knowledge of some sort. And what you're trying to do is understand that knowledge um, and what it might mean in terms of the values uh, in, in relation to water security. Think about the difference between working with and researching on communities and think about the kind of pressures that people have within communities as well as are facing between communities. So um, again, a few things to remember. Remember that many communities are actually invisible. So you need to think about when you're trying to think about communities, who's missing from this conversation? Who am I not seeing? Who do I need to contact? Don't underestimate the accidental in research. Um, and everybody from Einstein onwards uh, recognizes how important the accidental is in your research. So accidental conversations with people are really important and people that you might bump into. And of course you can create conditions where you actually do that. Gatekeepers I've mentioned before, but they again are really important and you need to contact them early. Uh, they may be people like village leaders or teachers, local authority uh, officials, NGOs, um, managers of particular organizations. And also you may need enablers or facilitators, particularly if you need interpreters, of course, uh, or intermediaries of some kind. And artists are very good at that kind of interpretive and intermediary work because of their creative outlook. But you might also then use youth workers, again, teachers and, and NGOs. So in terms of methods, what works? Well, um, it varies, of course, with communities, but what you really need to do is a scoping exercise to begin with. Lots of good background research about the communities that you might want to contact and um, consider, as I said, the people who may be missing from that. And then making contact, um, often, of course, meeting face to face, but that's quite difficult at the moment, potentially. Um, and so remote working may require more intermediaries and thinking about these gatekeepers more seriously. And I've given some more thoughts there, which you, you can look at as to what might, might help you in your, in your thinking about this. Um, in my own experience, actually sitting down and eating with people is really helpful um, in, in getting people to talk about their values. So I suppose just thinking about well, why actually do you want to even do this in the first place? Why do you want to involve people? 
or communities in your research and thinking about communities. So this little diagram just indicates that, of course, you can look at one sort of community and, and gain information, but you may not get the whole picture of what's going on. And that's why it's really important to try and think uh, about these different sorts of communities. Finally, also to recognize that not everybody is part of a community or actually wants to be part of a community. All these issues are extremely uh, difficult to deal with. It takes a lot of time and effort, both to contact communities and work with them. Luckily, we do have a bit of time in this project, but don't underestimate working with communities. However, I would say it's really rewarding, really, and it's really worth doing the background work. And I suppose in the end, this is why we are here, to find new ways of doing things, to ensure that we do our best to do research that achieves greater sustainability for the communities affected by water security.